But what is different in Drosophila telomeres compared to other eukaryotes? Well, telomeres in Drosophila do not consist of the telomeric repeats discussed before, but instead consist of several transposable elements. But what are transposons then? Transposons, or transposable elements, are sequences of DNA that can move around to different positions within the genome, a process called transposition. By randomly jumping around the genome, they cause mutations and change the amount of DNA in the genome. Transposons were first discovered by Barbara McClintock in mice. The mobility of these genetic elements cause different colors of mice kernels, as you can see in the image. McClintock earned the Nobel Prize in 1983 for her discovery. We now know that about half of our own genome is derived from transposable elements. There are two classes of transposons determined by the different mechanism of moving within the genome. Class I transposons are called retrotransposons and they move via an RNA intermediate. And class II are the DNA transposons that move directly from one position to another by being excised and reinserted. We want to look at the different ways in which transposons can move within the genome. We will start with the retrotransposons. The class of retrotransposons must be subdivided into LTR retrotransposons, LTR standing for long terminal repeats, and non-LTR retrotransposons, which are also called lines, which stands for long interspersed nuclear elements. The most complex class of transposons are the LTR retroelements. You can already see in the scheme where the name derives from. On both ends, the element is flanked by long terminal repeats. They are similar to retroviruses in their reproduction. They encode structural proteins, such as a capsid and a nucleocapsid, which corresponds to the GAG genes of retroviruses. And they encode enzymes, such as reverse transcriptase and endonuclease. These correspond to the retrovirus pol genes. However, there are no ENV genes encoded in the transposon, which makes it different from retroviruses in that the transposons cannot form independent infectious forms and jump from cell to cell because there is no envelope. These LTR elements have a size of 1 to 11 kilobytes and contribute to 8% of the whole human genome. Long interspersed nuclear elements got their name due to their common occurrence and widespread distribution in the genome. They occupy 17% of the human genome with a size of 6 to 8 kiloba kilobases each. Lines also have two open reading frames. They encode one protein that binds nucleic acid, but its function is not clear yet. And they encode a multifunctional protein with activities for DNA binding, cleavage and reverse transcription. These elements are not flanked by terminal repeats, but have a poly A tail at their three prime end. And this is how the LTR retrotransposons manage to transpose themselves. First, the element is transcribed into RNA. RNA can either be translated into protein or become genomic RNA and be encapsidated by the proteins. There is a specific packaging signal recognition site on the genomic RNA that interacts with the GAC proteins which then assemble to form the capsule surrounding the genomic RNA and the enzymes. Then reverse transcriptase becomes active and copies the RNA into DNA. After reverse transcription, the particle is broken down and the integrase recognizes the two ends with the LTR and inserts them into the host genome. The way lines transpose is slightly different and a bit more simple than the mechanism of LTR elements. First, the element is transcribed into RNA. The RNA moves into the cytoplasm, where it is translated into protein. The protein binds directly to the mRNA it was translated from. The protein RNA complex moves back into the nucleus. The protein nicks the target DNA at the point of insertion. The 3' end is used to initiate reverse transcription. After reverse transcription, the RNA is cleaved off the second strand of DNA is synthesized and the loose ends are ligated to the host genome. Often, not the whole element is reverse transcribed, but becomes truncated and loses the function of its protein. It can, however, still be transposed via transacting proteins of other elements. Some lines insert only at particular sites, 
for the enzymes can only recognize and nick a particular DNA sequence. Some transposons are known to insert themselves into other transposons or into copies of itself. However, most lines ins insert just randomly. We are now coming to the second class of transposable elements, the DNA transposons. They are quite simple elements. They do not produce an RNA copy of themselves and insert the copy in another position of the genome, but they get cut out and themselves become inserted somewhere else in the genome. They are about 1 to 10 kilobases long and encode only one protein and they have inverted repeats at the ends. The protein they encode is called transposase and is necessary for their transposition. It is a multifunctional protein that recognizes specific sequences, can cut out the transposon and insert it somewhere else. We will have a closer look. It is a cut and paste transposition. The gene for transposase is transcribed and translated into protein. The protein, here as shaded spheres, binds to specific recognition sequences in the inverted repeats of the element. The transposase then dimerizes and cleaves the transposable element out of the host DNA. It binds to a new target DNA, often in close proximity to its old position. At the target DNA, it gets inserted into the new site. Transposons are often called parasitic, but could they not be mutualists? We know that sometimes the insertion of a transposon can have a beneficial result, otherwise half of our genes would not be transposons. And also, transposons are a very important source of mutational variation. They are responsible for many chromosomal rearrangements, such as deletions, duplications, inversions or translocations. They do this by various means and thereby create mutations and variations in the genome that would not occur on any other way. Last but not least, it is believed that some features of transposons, such as the reverse transcriptase, were adopted by the host cells for their own benefit. However, the fact is, most effects of transposons are harmful to the host, which would mean that transposons are parasitic. They often disrupt essential genes by inserting randomly into these. Another fact that speaks for the parasitism is that transposition rates are much higher than excision rates, but still, transposons do not accumulate indefinitely. And that is because natural selection selects against them and reduces their frequency. Natural selection does that only when something is harmful to the host. So transposons are harmful and are called parasitic. The only reason why they persist is because they manage to achieve higher than Mendelian transmission rates. Being parasitic, however, does not mean they are only harmful. Sometimes the effect can be can by coincidence also be beneficial. Transposable elements belong to the group of selfish genetic elements, but in which way can we call them selfish? Of all so-called selfish elements, the transposons show the most unusual form of drive. While other selfish elements compete for representation at a given locus, transposons accumulate in the genome by producing copies of themselves and inserting them around the genome. Thereby, they reach higher than Mendelian transmission rates. Transposable elements can persist in a host gene pool even if every insert reduces the fitness of the host. They will maintain because transposable elements, on average, transpose more to a new location than they are driven out by natural selection. Transposable elements are expected to have developed several mechanisms to reduce their negative impact on the host without reducing their own transmission. But are really all transposable elements selfish? We had a closer look at the telomeres in Drosophila.